Great. Well, it's great to see you for the super turnout. Um, nice to see everyone here. We have folks listening upstairs as well. So okay. the closer you talk to the computer, so I should stand over here. Yes. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Can I turn this? Unless you roll too, you want to roll. Push the whole thing over. Like that, maybe? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, right. So like Steph said, I'm going to focus on uh, causes of flooding. I'm actually going to go pretty quickly through a lot of things, but there will be some time for uh, questions. Uh, I, I decided to start with the big picture, so I'm saying this is global down to local scale. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to cover four topics very quickly. Uh, I'm going to start with climate, talk briefly about weather, what was the weather situation on the Father's Day weekend, uh, give a brief overview of like hydrology 101 and then talk a little bit about hydraulics, the conveyance of these storm discharges and what causes damage. Uh, so uh, just briefly here, this is a trace of sort of the global average temperature over land and ocean. Uh, going back to the 1800s, it's normalized to a 20th century average. And so if we go off of that normal, uh, we see we've had about a one degree Celsius increase in temperature. All right, and the, and the warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold. And that's given by this relationship here on the right. And so if we've seen about a one degree increase in temperature, uh, that's essentially the thickness of this red line. And it's about a 7% increase in the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere can hold. Okay, so that alone tells us we can expect heavier rainfall events. But that doesn't completely explain the increases that we've seen. And what climate scientists are getting a better understanding of now is how atmospheric circulation is changing. So this is, this is a pretty technical graph, but um, so over on the left, Right, we, we hear a lot about the jet stream. Uh, there's, there's two jets here, a polar jet that circles the Earth at about 60 degrees north, and then a subtropical jet at a latitude of about 30 degrees. And then uh, the circulation between these, so this is now looking at sort of the flat Earth, <laughs> looking west with the equator on the left and the North Pole at the right. Uh, the warm air at the equator rises and it, and it sinks at about 30 degrees north on average. And then if we look at this polar cell, we have cold air at the North Pole sinking. And so that leads to these three cells of circulation, right, in the Northern Hemisphere, and then of course the opposite in the Southern Hemisphere. But what we're finding uh, as the Arctic warms faster on average in the mid latitudes, because ice and snow are melting and so it's it's darker, it can absorb more solar radiation, not reflect as much. That's what we call Arctic amplification. So the Arctic is warming faster than the mid latitudes. If you see here, there's sort of a slope here. Um, and there's a, there's a contrast between the pressure and the temperature in this polar cell and then the mid latitude cell of the feral cell. All right, and that sort of guides the polar jet. All right, so that, that's what leads to this jet stream circulating. But as this warms faster than this part, uh, it's, it's decreasing that slope. And that actually slows down the jet stream and it allows that jet stream to take a more meandering path, like a, like a lazy river <laughs> meandering. Um, and so that's what we've been seeing is climate patterns uh, that look something, or jet stream patterns that look something like this, very wavy, um, they get stuck. Uh, there's actually some more recent research that says these waves can sort of resonate. Um, so we're seeing some very extreme uh, jet stream patterns, basically. But that's, that's the link to climate here. Um, and so if we look at the Father's Day flood, this is uh, from the University of Maine. Uh, this is based on a weather model combined with observations, right? We don't have observations everywhere, so we can use models to, to map things like this. But this shows a, a difference from an average temperature. So on June 16th, the middle part of the U.S. was very warm. I remember that Saturday being a very uncomfortably <laughs> warm and muggy Saturday. 
Um, you can't probably can't see this too well, but there's sort of a low pressure trough here moving towards us, and that was pulling up a lot of this warm, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico. So that was sort of the, the day before the storm, what it looked like. And this, this, I'm sorry, it will not be very easy to see, but um, okay, so to orient you, this is the Great Lakes up here. <laughs> uh, this is the coast of California over here. So this is sort of looking at the continental US. What this is showing is basically a total amount of water in the atmosphere. So if you just take one column of the atmosphere and can condense all the water, we call that precipitable water. And so on the left, this is an average annual for I think the year 2000, but it generally shows you the pattern of this precipitable water. There's a lot more. This is the Gulf of Mexico down here, uh, and it decreases as you move north. You can see here, you know, for Houghton, we're sort of in the light to dark blue. Okay, but on June 16th, you can see what the pattern looked like. Uh, in Houghton, we were in this orange color uh, with actually a high, a very high bullseye over here in Wisconsin moving towards us. And so we had as much water vapor in the atmosphere above us as places in Louisiana and Alabama. That's why it felt like Louisiana and Alabama that day, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so anyway, that warm, humid air clashed with cold air and got stuck over us. And that's what led to these rainfall totals that I'm sure many of you experienced. <laughs> uh, again, sort of like a bullseye right over Houghton. This comes from the National Weather Service. Um, the measurement at the airport, uh, the data I downloaded had about five and a half inches was measured at the airport. But here you can see the color showing uh, just above six inches in some places, and this is over a six hour period from about midnight to 6 a.m. or 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. Um, so obviously this was a very extreme rainfall event and you probably heard on the news or um, saw this, what we talk about return periods, how likely do we expect rainfall of this magnitude to occur? And so this shows for some different rainfall durations. The peak one hour duration was measured at airport was uh, about 2.3 inches, uh, three hours was about four and a half, and then the six inch total at the airport again was 5.5, it may have been higher locally, right? And so based on the National Weather Service statistics, based on historical measurements, which were updated not that long ago, I think 2014, maybe they, they updated that. Um, the, the, these dots here show where these rainfall depths um, would trace on those curves and for the three hour duration and six hour duration that's very close to what they would have, what they consider to be a 1,000 year storm. So it has about a one tenth of one percent chance of occurring in any given year. Right, so it's highly unlikely but again this is based on historical records and if we're now seeing changes in our atmospheric circulation we, we don't really know what the likelihood of this is but we think it's more likely, right? And there have been other big storms that would indicate that we can expect, expect more intense rainfall more frequently because of uh, two things, warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture and the changing circulation patterns. I don't know if I should pause for questions or we'll take questions at the end, <laughs> but okay. So that's climate and weather <laughs> in a quick nutshell. Um, Alex, we're going to talk about this more, but this is like sort of a primer for hydrology. Okay, so we get a heavy rainfall event. How does that translate into flooding, right? Does it guarantee we're going to have flooding? Um, not necessarily, uh, but certainly it's affected by land use. That's what this graphic shows here. Um, sort of natural areas, vegetated areas, forests, if it's well-drained soils, you get a lot of infiltration, you would get less Surface runoff, this is what causes the flooding because it runs off very quickly, concentrates into our streams and drainage channels that they overflow. Um, that's what leads to the flooding. Uh, if we develop areas and add a lot of impervious surfaces, rooftops, roads, um, we get less infiltration and more runoff, less groundwater storage. So that, that's a well-documented um, aspect of development that's why as engineers we try to mitigate that with 
storage ponds or detention ponds, or Alex is gonna talk about green infrastructure to promote infiltration, um, keep the water from reaching our streams and drainage channels too quickly. Um, I guess this is, don't, don't look at the equation. <laughs> if I just look at this graph, I'll explain this graph. So this is a very simple model that engineers use. Maybe the, it's actually probably the second simplest model <laughs> that engineers use uh, to come up with designs for drainage structures, for example. And so I just picked uh, an example here with six inches of rain, which is what we saw uh, at the, during the Father's Day storm. And this shows, uh, we, we have big tables that we look things up based on the soil type and the land cover, but just as sort of an average case, if, the, if six inches of rain falls on a parking lot, a paved area, it, it's all gonna run off, right? That's pretty intuitive. Um, maybe not 100%, but clo very close to it. <laughs> Um, so we'll get close to six inches of, of runoff um, that has to go somewhere. Uh, using this method, if it's uh, sort of your average residential lots, uh, only about half of the rainfall would run off. And if it's a wooded area, um, it would be two inches or less, generally. It depends on a lot of things, depends on the conditions of the ground surface, the soil types, and so on. But this is just to illustrate um, that you know there's there's a lot of documentation of how obviously land use affects runoff so given that you have a six inch rainfall event how much flooding does it occur well of course it depends a lot on the on the watershed okay you got a question? Sorry. oh yeah that runoff explains why you're on when it bananas but it doesn't explain the Cobra river which is surrounded by the narrow trails and it mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah, right. So, um, well, uh, yes, I mean, even probably the Pilgrim River hasn't seen that much runoff in a long time. So, yeah, I mean, flooding can occur in natural channels as well as developed areas. So, um, like the one inch would maybe be more of what we were used to seeing, or two inches would be right. the same thing, so those yeah. we would expect them that runoff to be a lot less, or we just call it 55 pound neck down. Uh, yeah, right. Well, I guess that, I mean, if you were to develop the Pilgrim River watershed, you'd see worse flooding, but. What would be an example of typical rainstorm here in terms of I mean, you know, we're talking, is that one inch or um, two inch or? Yeah, I would say or? most, most years, I think two inches of rainfall would be the most you would see. Okay. Right? We did have another storm that was three inches of rainfall, like a month later, that was yeah. also unusual, but. Yeah. One thing that I think is important to consider is the analysis, you showed of that flood is site specific for but uh, thousand year designation would apply to a much larger area. We just unknown that the heavy rain came on us, and it could have well happened on on Tanagan or right. Ironwood or mm -hmm. something like this. And so, mm -hmm. I think this is an important thing for us to communicate that. What we're seeing is kind of a canary in the coal mine, in a sense that if we believe that these events are more likely, they're more likely over a broader area than just for us. Certainly, yes. <laughs> Do you happen to know, Dave, what the rainfall and that nasty Duluth event was? It was 12 inches. Uh, really? In 24 hours. Wow. wow. And it was very similar to here where it was right. really kind of moved off and then right. the issue like here with the steam. Overwhelmed the drainage systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. just the whole just infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that excuse this whole graph is the fact that we were intentionally 
industrial area, both for agriculture and also for mining for many, many decades. Um, the top of the hill from uh, Pimo County all the way down to Okanagan, the top of these ridges have been ditched by the mining companies to get the runoff out of there so it doesn't go down the shaft. Mm -hmm. A lot of the land, again, talking about the total, you see it forested now, but it used to be all farming. And that was a ditch. Even though there's forest there, it's still a ditch. Mm -hmm. And so the farms wanted to get rid of the water, the mines wanted to get rid of the water. And so when we had this episode, that compounded the whole thing. I got rid of the water. Right. And everybody downstream was destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Not the question I asked earlier about the two inch rainfall, if you look at woods, two inches is almost zero runoff. Whereas a six inch storm is two inches of runoff. So that right. explains why the pilgrim flooded. I mean, typically we get zero, almost zero. Right. Yeah. And this is the, this is not meant as any particular analysis of the Father's Day flood. This is just an example of a very general model that engineers might use to, to make predictions, but I can't say that we've done any uh, detailed analysis of, of that storm event, so I don't want to make any anyway, statements of, about that, but but right. Um, yeah. Do, do you have access to uh, rainfall records that go back uh, 200 years, 100 years? 50 at least we've been around here for a while. Um, well, uh, in the late 1990s, uh, we did a study for the Michigan DOT, the state climatologist at the time compiled data for us. We, we had rainfall data back, I, I don't know, generally to like the 1920s, I can't remember, but um, it's not 200 years old, but we had 50 years of data in many places. I think for Hancock, we had 45 years of data at the time, so now it would be 65 years was our typical rainfall records. So, uh, so what, what were, were there other spikes and how did they compare to this? Uh, yeah, you would see other very large storm events in different places, um, but I don't think the Western UP had seen a storm like this in that record. So, okay, uh, just to, uh, a few more slides here. So. In addition to the amount of runoff, as, as someone the gentleman in the back said, it also depends on the how quickly it, it runs off. Um, so the, these two curves, so this is again just kind of an example of let's say pre-development, if it's natural woodlands or grasslands, and that's replaced by an urban development, you would see more runoff, but you would also see it gets uh, concentrated faster. So you get a higher peak discharge. All right, yeah, I should orient you. This is stream discharge here over time. And so this might be from a large event without development and then with development, uh, peak occurs sooner and it's also higher. And that depends on the drainage pathways through the watershed. And one interesting thing about the um, Father's Day storm, this is analysis done by Rudy <laughs> over there, thanks. Um, uh, he delineated the, some of the watersheds here in the Houghton Hancock area, uh, applied, a, called a preliminary uh, model to estimate uh, what we call a time of concentration. That's how long does it take for the entire watershed to drain to the outlet, right? And so the faster that happens, um, the, you know, the, again, the higher the peak can be from an intense rainfall event. And what we noticed here, so Ripley Creek watershed was about three hour time of concentration. Uh, Sweet Town Creek was about five hours. Uh, the Pilgrim River was 10 hours. But, but all these watersheds that had a lot of damage were sort of in the three to 10 hour range, was, which was approximately the duration of the storm. We had very intense rainfall over three hours. Ripley Creek was all contributing outflow, you know, down at, in the Ripley neighborhood in three hours. <laughs> uh, same with Sweet Town Creek, five hours. We saw that there was a thousand year intensity rainfall for that five hour duration. Um, the Pilgrim River, uh, well, yeah, that took out the bridge upstream. So that was 10 hours duration to, uh, to the highway. 
probably right. So I don't know, the upstream bridge would have had a shorter time of concentration, probably about the same as the most intense rainfall. So I think that contributed to the fact that these watershed response times happen to be about the same duration of the, this very intense rainfall. Is, does this analysis relate to that previous slide that shows when that bulb shows up? Is that well, say or yeah, basically, right. So it's like if the rain started here and uh, yeah, that's, that's roughly the response time of the watershed. With the yep. amount of rainfall that it received. Yeah. So it would be more protracted if there was less rainfall? Um, well, it, 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 it depends on the, the duration of the rain cycle. So for example, let me give another example. Um, the Sturgeon River, right, uh, it reached flood stage, but it wasn't a very damaging flood because it's a much larger watershed with a much larger response time. So it was able to sort of average out those flows over a longer period. It got intense rainfall for six hours, but then it stopped. The watershed is responding over a long time period. The larger watersheds in this area, like even the Trap Rock and the Sturgeon, they have their highest peak discharges usually in the spring when there's snowmelt occurring, rapid snowmelt over a longer time period. Um, they usually wouldn't see their biggest floods from a short, intense rainfall event, but the smaller watersheds would. So these, these times would provide a framework for warning in individual watersheds if they were accurate, but isn't the groundwater saturation going to affect the duration of, how, in other words, how long the water gets there because you might have to saturate the ground if it was dry? Yes. Yep. Um, and I'm, I've sort of skipped over that, but right, that would be another factor. What are the soil moisture conditions when the so, rainfall starts? So what were the, do, do we know anything about the conditions? Uh, I, I think it was pretty wet before that. Um, I don't know that we have measurements of that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. so Dave, doesn't, doesn't the size of the floodplain matter too? Because on the pilgrim, where it was narrow, there was damage, but where there was wetlands or a bigger flood plain, it's very little damage. Yes, definitely. So right. Mm -hmm. That may be, but I mean, when you're talking about a river, when it's flooding, it's got a big plain to flood over, it's not going to cause as much damage if it's a narrow channel. Right. Um, yeah, I have maybe one slide on that <laughs> coming up. Um, so, I, actually, this audience could give this talk, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and this, this is based on very rough averages, but if you, if you look at a stream and you look at flow at the top of its bank, on average, that's a flow that you would see roughly every two years. And, and it varies a lot, so, I mean, certainly individual cases, this wouldn't hold necessarily. But, but that's a, just a, a flow that occurs frequently enough, it's going to scour away the vegetation and the banks, and that would be bank full. Um, but then there's, as Sally said, the, the floodplain area. Uh, this shows two ranges of floodplain. One we call hydrologic floodplain. We don't expect it to flood every year or two, but maybe one in 10 years, right? And then above that, or might be even, even wider floodplain, uh, where really large floods would have, would have scoured that out. Um, so, so this is just natural streams, right? If, if they haven't seen a large flood event in a long time, um, you know, you'll have vegetation growing out here and trees, um, and, and something comes along like a quote unquote 1000 year flood and it's, it's going to cause damage because it's just larger than has been observed in that stream for a long time, right? Uh, the other thing, of course, to keep in mind, and this is where I should have brought my shield for the tomatoes and rotten fruit. Um, as engineers, we do not design for 1,000-year floods. It's just an, it's an economic thing. Guidelines you know, with the Michigan Tech, the Michigan Tech, uh, Michigan Department of Transportation guidelines. Um, they might be 50-year storm or 100-year storm for interstates. That's, that's just how we design our infrastructure. 
Um, and then I just want to point out here that in addition to designing infrastructure, it's a, it's a constant issue of maintaining and replacing old infrastructure. This just shows some ways that culverts can uh, be affected over time or fail. Um, obviously, if there's there's debris. The other thing about large floods is it carries away, carries lots of sediments and debris, and once those block drainage pathways and, and culverts, our physical infrastructure, then sort of like all bets are off unless we can design more resiliently to sort of plan for that happening. Maybe have a floodplain area where the water can go if a particularly narrow area gets blocked, <laughs> right? Um, so I just wanted to add that slide here and, and say that, yeah, maybe we need to change our design standards. Uh, in 2013, there were federal guidelines issued that said for federal projects, we should start designing for 500 year floods. Um, you know, has that carried down to state and local levels? Not, not yet. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of, to emphasize that, so from Ripley to Lake Linden, there's two railroad lines. One is owned by the DNR, one is owned by MDOT. From um, Franklin, yeah, from Franklin, from uh, the Quincy Mine down to Mason, there's another railroad line. These lines were maintained where the companies were here. Since the companies have left, they've become trails, but they're not maintained. And so the culverts have become full and you have all these little ravines all the way along that way. And they've been filled, the railroad companies for their lines, fill those ravines in, had culverts on the bottom of them to let water out. Since the culverts haven't been maintained, what happens is they create a dam and the, the uh, culverts work slowly. But this event, it not only created a dam, but it went over the dam and eventually took those ravines and washed them downstream. And so that's what caused a lot of the destruction from Ripley to Lake Wayne. Mm -hmm. Right. <coughs> so, pass it over to Alex yeah. so this was my summary of the problems, and Alex will have the solutions. Just a minute while I pull up my presentation. Okay, well, thanks for this great turnout and thanks for the invitation mm -hmm. and uh, what Dave presented, um, I think is a nice segue to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, Dave and I are sometimes joined at the hip, so that's not, not too surprising. We, we did consult on this, but it's, uh, it looks like it's going to work out. So I'm going to talk to you about land use change and uh, along with that, talk to you about um, how we can manage storms using, uh, using uh, nature. Okay, so I'm also like Dave going to start with uh, with a global picture and then narrow it down to um, a local picture uh, in a few slides. So, looking at the whole Earth uh, in 2030, there are predictions that five billion people will live in cities, and 60 percent of those urban areas will be built between 20, 2000 and 2030. Think about the large cities in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so forth. Those are going to get much larger than they are now. And much of that growth is going to occur just in these few decades here. At the same time, uh, we uh, are already observing that environmental events, such as storms, heat waves, and so forth, are likely to occur more often and also to be more severe in their, in their magnitude. And uh, although that uh, the bullet says that 60% of the urban areas across the globe will be will have been built just in those last few decades or so. We have legacy infrastructure to worry about, and um, the legacy infrastructure that we have is um, that we already have the problems that uh, that that infrastructure uh, faces already is going to be exacerbated. And we already know that stormwater runoff <laughs> can be a major cause of flooding and also water pollution in urban areas. So if you look at this, 60% of urban areas will have been built over just those last few decades. That's actually an opportunity, right? 
Um, as these urban areas expand out further and further, there is the opportunity perhaps to build the stormwater systems in a way that they can become re more resilient to um, these uh, expected changes in environmental events. Okay, now coming back to Michigan, looking into the future, uh, these are uh, land cover maps for uh, uh, relatively recently, 2011, and then looking towards uh, 2050. These are projections from the U.S. Geological Survey. And the colors here des designate land uses. I know it's hard to read the labels in the back, but basically the green and the blue are, uh, are us, good, <laughs> forests and wetlands. <clears throat> you can start moving downstate and you can probably guess what the yellow is, that's agriculture, and I'm sure you've guessed what the red is, uh, which is urban areas. So if you look at the Upper Peninsula, not much is expected to happen. Our, our tiny towns might grow a little bit. I think the reds even up, up here are a little bit exaggerated. Downstate, even though uh, projections maybe the population will not increase or maybe even decrease, there is still an expectation that urban areas will expand because most of the expansion, urban expansion that occurs these days is, is low density housing and so forth. <coughs> Now looking, uh, again, uh, getting, getting closer, now this is recent history. Some of you may have seen these pictures before, so we're looking at the M26 corridor starting in 74 with not much going on uh, to, to 79 and then 2009. And uh, there's additional, of course, commercial activity that's, um, that's been put along the M M26 corridor since 2009. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, nature-based solutions, which is also uh, another word for, for green infrastructure. So um, I'm gonna talk about very briefly about forests and wetlands. And uh, for forests then, what do they do for us? How do they uh, help us out uh, against extreme events like we, we just, uh, we saw recently here? So forests can regulate the water supply and they do that uh, through several different ways. So. Uh, trees can capture rainfall, so for small rainfall events, if you're standing under a tree, you may never feel the rain, right? If it's only raining perhaps a couple of tenths of inches, the canopy of the tree will capture that water, and then eventually that water will evaporate away. If the, uh, the, storage, if the storage in the canopy is exceeded, then we start to, we start to feel the, uh, uh, the rain underneath the tree. Um, so that's one way that, uh, that, that uh, again, forests can, um, can help to regulate water. Also forests and any kind of vegetation, they transpire water. So um, they also can uh, reduce flows uh, on a larger time scale by uh, pumping out water vapor, uh, pumping out water from the soil and out through the leaves as water vapor. And also infiltration, so the trees, um, may not directly do this, but we find typically, typically in forests that soils are very permeable. And that's really as a result of natural processes, roots and so forth, um, uh, decaying soil, worms and, and uh, so forth, creating uh, larger holes in the soil material as opposed to uh, soils um, in, in, other, in other land uses. Um, and so those are a few ways where how soils can help us regulate the hydrologic cycle in water. Water quality then forests also can enhance that by filtering pollutants um, and then also by reducing erosion because vegetation in general can uh, hold, is better at holding soil, is good at holding soil um, and uh, therefore would, would help in, in reducing erosion. Uh, wetlands also regulate water supplies. Uh, they store water during storms and then steadily release the surface water uh, at, at a lower rate typically, and also by, by recharging groundwater. And um, I've heard some uh, comments from people about uh, wetlands, for example, and if you're on creek watershed, uh, whether the compromising of the wetlands there over the last few decades or so by, by uh, but commercial development could have had an impact on the, on the flow in Huron Creek. I haven't done the calculations yet myself, but I would suspect this storm, I think maybe what Dave was, was relaying a little bit, this is an unusual storm. 
So even if we, I suspect that even if the wetlands had been intact, that it would have been difficult for those wetlands to take up the storage. The storage, the storage uh, uh, volume of the, of, the, of the wetlands just could not, cannot contend with six inch storm. However, smaller storms, wetlands can certainly uh, handle, uh, handle that. Um, and then also wetlands enhance water quality by food, uh, filtering out all sorts of pollutants from suspended solids to metals, organics, and, and so forth. So forests and wetlands help us uh, uh, regulate water flow, regulate water quality uh, in, these, in these different ways. But of course, we have other land uses. Uh, we have things that we need to uh, live with. We live, we have, uh, we have farms that produce us with food, they're part of our culture. We have big cities where we can, uh, where, where we can live. But as you might suspect that uh, these, land, these land uses don't exactly look like forests and um, uh, wetlands. And so uh, they may have a, uh, a different effect. And Dave has already pointed it out, looking at, pre, looking at uh, hydrologic um, impacts pre um, and post, uh, post development. So thinking kind of broadly, if we want to think about managing the land in a sustainable way, one way, one definition of that is adopting land use systems, practices, uses, and so forth that enable the, the people that own the land, the land users, to maximize their economic benefits, but while maintaining or enhancing the hydrologic services, hopefully similar to ones that I just pointed out to before that trees and wetlands can provide us. So the question in some of, uh, some of my research then is, how do these different land uses and land covers maintain or enhance uh, hydrologic functions of the landscape? If we want hydrology to be controlled as it is by forests and wetlands, are there other ways we can manage land uses and land covers to provide those, those sorts of hydrologic functions? And I've been using land use, land cover, sometimes together. They're sort of the same thing. Land cover is, is a geographic term that refers to what do you see on the surface of the land, forest or <clears throat> forest, permeable pavement, or sorry, pavement and so forth. Whereas land use usually refers to the activity on the land, whether it's farming, uh, urbanized area or not. So they're kind of used and they're changing. Um, so um, the real question is then, how can how do land use land covers affect these important hydrologic processes like interception by the canopy of trees, transpiration from uh, from uh, vegetation, uh, enhanced uh, enhanced infiltration because the soils are more permeable? Uh, those are the key hydrologic processes, and if they work right, they'll provide us with key hydrologic services, which are water flow sufficient water flow uh, in the case. A water supply and then in floods uh, not too much water flow and then of course we want the right, the right quality. So uh, Dave showed some pictures of what I think is could be referred to as gray infrastructure. So uh, now I'm talking about infrastructure for uh, handling stormwater in urban areas. Uh, and so we would call this maybe conventional practices where we collect the water in detention ponds if needed we have pipe drainage, and then if necessary, that stormwater may need to be treated before it's discharged into a river, a lake, or other surface water. So generally speaking then, gray infrastructure is designed to move the water away as fast as possible uh, from the built environment. And built environment really means mostly impermeable areas. So having more impermeable area means that the water is going to be moving faster off the landscape and conventional stormwater systems that are built to get that water out of the urban landscape as quickly as possible. Um, green infrastructure is different in several ways, and I'm just pointing out that there are several terms that, have been, that are used more or less interchangeably for green infrastructure, such as low impact development and nature-based solutions. So these rely on natural hydrologic functions, some of the ones I pointed out the trees have and, and, uh, uh, and wetlands have to reduce the, uh, the amount of runoff and also its rate to, um, to allow for groundwater recharge and also to protect or improve water quality, including reducing erosion. 
And when we think about green infrastructure, I kind of divide it geographically in two, two parts. There's the urban area itself, where we would like to uh, make sure we can manage the stormwater properly, and green infrastructure may help that. And then there's, there's the, the watershed that's upstream of the city. We also would like to uh, perhaps see that the upstream, uh, upstream land is managed in a way that resembles natural uh, hydrologic functions. Okay, so now I'm just gonna show uh, pretty quickly some examples of green infrastructure. I'm gonna bet that many of you have, um, have seen these or heard of these sorts of examples. So this is an example of a rain garden in front of a house here. So rain gardens store water, and by detaining the water, they allow groundwater recharge. The plants also will transpire water uh, over a longer time period, um, which also will reduce, will have some effect on reducing runoff. You can also see um, here, so this rain garden is receiving runoff from the house, but you can also see there's this little uh, small, uh, you know the technical term. Oh, right. Thank you. <laughs> curb, curb cut. I was going to say the curb is lower. Thank you. Uh, to allow uh, runoff from the street to also go into uh, into that rain garden. Um, swales are um, constructed uh, constructed uh, constructed materials where. Uh, that are meant to collect and direct the water. So there's one of these swales up on top of um, uh, Hancock, um, kind of around, near the Birch Grove area and closer to the Sweet Town Creek that was installed by Bruce Peterson, if he's here or not, and uh, was likely, uh, likely had a, a good, a very good impact on reducing the flow coming into, uh, into Hancock. So these can be done either at the large scale, like you see in the bigger picture there, or also small scale just along, uh, along streets. So you can see the swales are meant to capture the water, slow it down, and allow it to, uh, to infiltrate. Okay, and as I go through these, these are different labels. You can probably guess that these sorts of things just kind of merge into each other. Like the, um, here's a bioretention pond. Maybe that's not so different from a rain garden, but it's designed specifically to provide some sort of biological treatment of any pollutants that might be contained in the runoff, in addition to storing and slowing down uh, the water. Uh, and constructed wetlands um, are also useful, are also store water, uh, can enhance infiltration and improve water quality. And in fact, these engineered weapons are sometimes used specifically to treat things like wastewater. Okay, um, permeable pavement. So now moving on to uh, um, maybe more small scale things. So permeable pavement, as you can, as you might guess by the name, is pavement that can allow greater infiltration rates than typical asphalt or concrete. Um, you can see some examples of this in a few driveways around towns. You can also see some examples of this at Hancock Beach. Uh, and also, I think it's Lake Linden Beach. So uh, Hancock had a system installed at the beach where it's permeable pavement. And also, I should mention, contains um, uh, a swale. So if you've seen the new parking lot after it was constructed, it's graded down towards the center. And in the center of the parking lot, there's a swale to uh, collect the water and allow it to uh, infiltrate um, into, the, uh, into the groundwater. Okay, very simple thing. If you're thinking about trying to uh, reduce uh, flow into a gray, uh, gray, if we have a gray infrastructure system, try to reduce flow into it, is to disconnect downspouts. So I believe that we don't have any or we're not supposed to have any connected downspouts to our stormwater system, so a city manager in the office. Is that right? Are there rules preventing connections of downspouts to stormwater systems? Stormwater. Okay, okay. So many cities, in, um, um, in, imagine much larger cities, uh, taking all the water from the roof and downspouts, connecting that to the stormwater system, um, 
That provides, of course, quite a bit of the stormwater that's entering the system. Disconnecting the downspouts from the stormwater systems and allowing the water to infiltrate, storing it in rain barrels and using it later um, is, um, will again, redirect the water, reduce the load on the gray water infrastructure and encourage um, infiltration. Um, green roofs, again, I bet some of you have seen pictures of these before. So there's a green, uh, partial green roof on the Great Lakes Research Center. So these also store water and reduce runoff. So a green roof um, may be able to evapotranspire as much as 50% of the water or even more that falls on the roof, depending on the situation. So those were some examples of green infrastructure. Any, any questions about that or any other green infrastructure examples any of you have had experience with? Okay, must have been an exhaustive list. Okay, so, um, so, the, 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 um, so the next, um, so uh, the, there's some technical issues, of course, with designing and installing green infrastructure. There are many, many, many best management practice guides uh, out, out there that can describe the expected reductions in runoff and so forth, reductions in water quality, depending on the particular green infrastructure uh, uh, method that you're going to be using. Uh, there are uh, many issues uh, that you have to consider when designing them, for example, uh, soil. So um, there was a, a uh, Big adoption, uh, a large adoption of green infrastructure in Seattle, for example, several years ago. Um, but Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, part of the issue was that the soils there are very impermeable. It was more for salmon uh, reintroduction. But so the problem was that the, the, some of these methods didn't work very well because the soils underneath the retention ponds and so forth were also the impermeable. I'm not that familiar. Okay. okay. So anyway, just a just a site specific uh, site specific issue. So those are tech. Yes. So I mean, in an event like you're saying, we're going to get more bigger rains. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me you're going to have to put a heck of a lot of this stuff in, in a system to be able to. I mean, it's just going to be overwhelmed still and trashed. I mean, so you're investing in something that's going to help, but it's not going to mitigate something like that. That, that's right. I mean, the, the one in 1,000 gets to Dave's comment also about what we should be designing for. I think that can be part of a community decision too, right? If we're going to be discussing how to invest in things like green infrastructure, respond to the Father's Day flood, it's important to think about what do we uh, want to plan for. Also keeping in mind that I'm guessing that Dr. Webster will point this out that we can look at past history and see, oh yeah, there were this many storms over the last 50 years, but history history seems is invented every day now, I think. But that's the new normal. So we don't really even know, can't necessarily even use the historical record to Yeah, to it seems that. like having realities like costs. They're gonna have a hard time saying let's plan culverts for a thousand year events because they don't want to even pay for a hundred year event the extra cost so i mean we're going to have to come up with cost effective solutions that are going to have the biggest um, impact on you know moderating these events i think that's that's a great way to say it one, one point uh, maybe you were making there too is that um it's not all not all about abandoning great infrastructure this working with what you have and perhaps adding things like green infrastructure to reduce the load on the, on the current system. And now, now that I'm an old guy and I don't walk very well, I've become a real advocate of going out and looking at stuff. <laughs> that sounds funny, but I think in this case, um, we need to learn from the specifics of this event we need to walk these watersheds and we need to see what happened in what place. For example, because uh, of certain tributary of whatever drainage caused more of the problems than, sure. than others. Sure. Uh, the idea of 
you know, stress points in this and the relationship to things like culverts. That was especially clear in Houghton, where there was so much damage associated with those um, kinds of features. And also paved areas and what the impact is of paved areas, because I think inputs from paved areas, you know, so there's a lot to be learned from this and and focus green infrastructure or whatever you want to call it. It's not all green infrastructure, mm -hmm. but focus attention to, to those critical points seems to me more important than this, but then that well then the general concept of this. Oh sure, know. sure. Yeah. So um I'm what we're talking about now is the generalities. These are things that you can think about doing. As I, as, as, I guess my excuse, as I understand this series is that we're gonna get more and more and more specific. And I think it'd be great to see in the end that there are some, uh, some things like you've suggested where we are talking about priority areas and so forth. Just that Alex, you went for a walk down the watershed just the other day. Creek, and I do believe that there were places like the, um, there's some examples of remediation work that had been done that held up in the Huron Creek where there's other places that didn't. So that even, you know, something to think about is that even though, and I don't know the particulars exactly behind that, I don't to model it, but some of these things did work in a, in a place like within Huron Creek and where other, you know, where just a little simple remediation wasn't, I don't know how it's really mm -hmm. expensive enough, but. Uh, so if they do work, even with this magnitude of storm storm, giving them. Mm -hmm. So um, these issues here are now getting a little bit away from maybe the hard technical issues and more into the, the to the human dimension. So if we think green infrastructure is desirable, how do we go about adopting it? And first, there's the who. So these um, methods that I just described go all the way from the homeowner, right? right? personal rain garden, barrel, and so forth, but also to decision makers at the municipal level, county level, and so forth. Um, so, Bill, you were talking about where should we do this? So we should plan, right? So um, uh, urban planning, um, as we plan our, um, as we'll, we look back and we plan into the future for um, where we want developments to go, how they should be built, that should be built into urban planning, which I think it is already quite a bit. Watershed planning, now we're stepping up to the watershed area, and many people would say that, uh, especially planning for hydrology, it makes sense to look at the watershed level and not just the city or the urban areas uh, within. Um, and institutional approaches, managerial, which they somewhat um, go on, on the top of each other, Ordinances. So the city of Houghton has a stormwater ordinance, if you didn't know that. Um, and that stormwater ordinance does prescribe how runoff off the of properties uh, um, should be handled, including the potential for uh, potential for green infrastructure. Alex, maybe we should say right there who's responsible for that stormwater runoff, not just how it will be handled, right? So who's going to pay for it? Like, you know, the big box stores? That's a good point. And, and if I don't get to it as I go through all this stuff, please please raise it again. So when um, ordinances, so the Z word, which I won't even say out loud. Uh, um, stormwater utility. So the city of Marquette has a stormwater utility in addition to the wastewater and the water utility. So that means when uh, new development comes along, wants to hook up to the stormwater system, there's a fee that has to be paid for the hookup, and then there's some sort of peri periodic fee on top of it. And that's meant, those, that money is meant to maintain the system, to expand it, either using gray infrastructure or green infrastructure. Um, watershed, I mentioned watershed-wide planning, so watershed districts and management plans, so uh, several of our watersheds around here, including here on Creek, have watershed management plans. Those are plans that gather input from the community, do some engineering and scientific work, and come up with recommendations for ways to improve and protect 
watershed. So when you look up these watershed management plans, which are uh, in Michigan, are uh, um, usually adopted by the state. You can look at those, you can see what the uh, the problems are today and what or when, when the plan was made and also what the recommendations are. And who's responsible for implementing those? Pardon? Who's responsible for implementing those? For implementing them? Um, anybody who wants to apply for the money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So watershed districts. In the county of Fulton, you have a watershed district manager. The townships have most of the land. Mm -hmm. Hancock and Bowdoin are minuscule compared to what the townships mm -hmm. do. Sure. The townships can create watershed districts. The people who own the property in the watershed districts can create the districts. But if you don't have the support of the people in the district, it doesn't happen. The way the district functions is that the people in the district are assessed a certain amount of money, and that money is yearly, and that goes into projects to do what needs to be done as determined by the leadership district manager, which the county employs. The thing it is, is we can't get people. Us here with council supervisor, we try to set up one on the uh, chicken bone. And it didn't happen because some of the people said, no, I'm not going to pay for this. I'm on the top of the hill. Why do I pay for this? It's for the board members. So what happened? You had a person down on uh, uh, Woodside almost lost their house. And so the people here, most of you probably don't live in the city and you live in the townships. Your neighbors don't want this. So that's why it doesn't happen. I think those are very important comments, and it's this sort of upstream, downstream disconnect. It's all over the country, all over Michigan, all over the world for, for that matter. And how do you get around that through long, slow, careful talking? Probably and this is not going to happen overnight. Um, and sometimes when you know supervisors change, there's some opportunity, right? I think Bowdoin and Portage Township may have had some maybe conflicts in the past and some of those conflicts anyway, won't make for people but anyway uh supervisors uh, turned over city managers turned over and there has been quite a bit i would say of collaboration between Porter's township and, and holding <coughs> you just mentioned that there is a watershed district on Kira. there is a watershed management plan so is it is it uh, a municipal plan or a uh, township plan or a, a joint plan? It's, so the plan, okay, the the plan. So the Huron Creek watershed is is roughly half and half. City of Houghton and Portage Township is a tiny piece of Sand Township. The plan was developed um, by uh, an advisory committee, which included representatives from Houghton. Houghton, the city of Houghton and Portage Township, uh, Portage Township, and uh, uh, neighborhood groups, environmental groups, developers, and so forth. Was this after the flood or before the flood? A way before. This was approved in 2009. Okay. That's when the climate was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Alan, there's yeah. a um, interruption. Yes. 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 Um, I know that we've gone to get folks in folks like we look great at this time. Um, also, a reminder that there are two groups of players um, and that this is really just a brainstorm. This is a divergent space. That's why we brought some experts here to put some ideas on the table. It doesn't mean we're going to do anything in a particular way. Um, we want to start a conversation and not you know, end it here. So keep that in mind that we really want to have this be a, a beginning. So if you're interested in part of the conversation, we have um, a sign in sheet in the back where you can check the box that you'd like to get. To get updates, um, so just wanted to give folks a chance to, to head out if you have obligations at home. Um, otherwise, we can we can keep the conversation going. So thanks. Alex, you know, uh, th there's some interesting things that could be done right away. It turns out, like the uh, DA put the structure, they want to know when they put in a house here, mm -hmm. for example, what what is the water level? Mm -hmm. What is historically been the water level? And that information is usually not passed on to the person that's constructing the house. And of course, we've had a meeting of different house levels. 
It's the same thing that they can, they're willing to do it. So the same thing could be done with the watershed properties too. Yeah. So I give them information about historic floods, you know, how frequent they are and for floodplain, what's the danger of building your house on a sure. floodplain? And I think information is so important, right? And having information available to people to make these decisions. But the, the constructors have mentioned that to me. I see. Well, I'm, I'm coming back to this, but uh, I'm really concerned with us uh, whether the effects in these watersheds, especially along the streams, are adequately recorded before they get destroyed mm -hmm. by the wind turbines. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I'd like to see and what I think is more important than all these organizational activities is to have volunteers walk up these streams with their cell phones mm -hmm. and record the position and the photographs of what happened along the stream. So do we have a record of where the action was? And I think that will serve as well. And it's it's not it's gonna be obscured very soon if it hasn't been done. I suspect there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands, even more photographs and movie clips that are out there right now already. Um, maybe it still are some missing areas, but perhaps the big thing is to pull those things together, right, from people, make sure they're located correctly, time stamp and so forth. I think Dave, as a student, is yeah. interested in that. I forgot to show the slide, and so <laughs> would you mind? <laughs> So the the point of these is just to point out some some different ways of thinking about uh, trying to get green infrastructure adopted. Um, I, there are lots and lots of financial issues. I just mentioned financial incentives. So the stormwater utilities uh, uh, in many places where stormwater utilities are around. If uh, homeowners and developers adopt green infrastructure um, projects, they will give rebates, uh, in other words, reduce their stormwater utility uh, fee. Uh, one other, so there have been a couple of comments about why things don't happen, um, and that's really, it's a people person mostly. So if something is driven by regulation, a stormwater issue is driven by regulation, it is some threshold being exceeded, maybe as something like a total maximum daily load, then those regulations should in, should spur the improvements. But in many cases when we're dealing with stormwater, there is not some kind of regulation that has been exceeded. And so in that case, it has to, it needs to come from the ground up and will require some sort of community organization because much of this really is, is, vol is voluntary. And um, just to end, so, We've been focusing, when we looked at these green infrastructure um, types of projects or methods, we focus exclusively on the benefits to hydrology and water quality. But there are many, many other benefits which makes these, uh, has made these green infrastructure uh, methods quite popular. So they could save money, right? That's where we perhaps need to start. And when they say save money, um, if the storm, the gray infrastructure, the gray infrastructure stormwater system is overwhelmed, needs to be expanded, and, um, and so forth, uh, that costs uh, millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars. And green infrastructure methods, like the ones I point out here, can essentially replace that expansion. And there are many case histories around the country that show there were that there are savings. The green infrastructure method uh, costs money. But uh, 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 so um, sometimes much less than um, the cost of expanding gray infrastructure. So the city of Chicago is a really good example. Uh, uh, that city has invested a tremendous amount of money in the green infrastructure, its perennial pavement along the alleys and so forth. And for Chicago, it seemed to make perfect financial sense. Their stormwater system is being overwhelmed. To expand the pipes and so forth is outrageously expensive in Chicago, mostly because they're on bedrock there. And so it made perfect, very good sense here to do something on top to reduce the uh, um, reduce the, the load on, on the stormwater system. Um, and then there are many, many other, there, there, I've just listed a few things here. Um, 
uh, the other benefits, so I show pictures of rain gardens and so forth, those can provide habitat um, and, and enhance biodiversity. Uh, mitigating climate change and more vegetation that we have uh, by uh, planting trees and, and vegetation. Uh, uh, we can mitigate climate change by taking in carbon dioxide. Uh, regulating the climate, so another event, uh, sort of event other than storms that I think really needs to be on our horizon is, is heat events. And so more green means uh, typically reducing the heat. And all of these things can add up to improving community life, livability. So, um, and many intangibles underneath that, for example, aesthetics. Um, some, some of those pictures I showed you are, are, are uh, things that would be were pleasing to us. And then even discussions around green infrastructure, because they are complicated and they do require dialogue, hopefully can add to our social capital, our community uh, spirit, just by engaging in, in those sorts of conversations. And uh, I think I'll stop there and I'll find Dave's next slide. Oh. <laughs> Oh, Dave, you want to mention this? Yeah. So, uh, so Sarah Washville is a graduate student with Sarah Brown Engineering, and uh, she wants to put together uh, what's called a story map of the flood. Uh, that would be a geographic information system base system. Uh, but she wants to be able to tell the story of, of the flooding and the damage and uh, actually maybe collaborate with Ruby <laughs> on some of the hydrology and some technical information in there. But anyway, if you would like to contribute to that project, um, her email address is there. Um, she's asking for any images uh, related to the flood, uh, either during the flood or after the flood, if it shows how high the water levels got or some storm damage. I should be very really appreciate contributions. Thank you. So, more questions, comments? Is she there? Is she in the room? No, she couldn't make it. So, I would argue, Bill, that it's not that critical to get everything now because, in my humble opinion, we're not going to be getting all the full effect of this storm that's going to go through the spring melt on top of everything that's been changed that's going to be typically seen so much impacts to our hydrology and things. So I, I think the story isn't done yet and it's going to go through at least one spring mallet. If they have something else happen, they're going to destroy the effects. Yeah, I'm not arguing it's important. I'm just saying I don't think the story, I think we're, I don't think also, the story is told until we go through that sort of normal big cycle we go through every year. Also, you need to know the tributaries that were not damaged. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's, a, that's important too, to just to see because that will teach you. And the other what's... thing I think is super important is to have this series and because we have a, a whole cohort of people who've experienced something really dramatic here, and that in and of itself is going to be a trigger for interest and engagement. And so it's going to be timely that we capture that. And you know, that's going to last. Like 20 years, probably, people are still going to remember and talk about this event. And so, those kind of impacts we see, we have this window of opportunity for where there are people that have direct experience with this. So, my point is just when an event like this happens, come on. The first priority ought to be to just map it. So, so we'll see what it is. I had a conversation with one of the FEMA staff that was here for on the order of 90 days, working every day long hours documenting the bejesus out of this. And I don't know whether he was only looking at infrastructure or only natural systems or not. But I think there's a significant body of information that's already been collected. Getting access to it should be, I mean, it should be public information. Sure. But whether your students can articulate with this or not, I don't know. This guy 
was on his feet on the order of 12 hours a day for most of nine days. Right. But in his testimony. But, but what I'm saying is we have a lot of students just in our department alone. We've got dozens of students that have just the skills of going up the river and mapping mm -hmm. sites. And so with a few volunteers walking these streams at the right time, we, we have a good data set, I think. And I think that's more important. Then we can work on infrastructure of a local uh, mm -hmm. device to integrate the data, but that, that information is going to go away. Well, and I think the challenge that here, in addition to that, is that we might not have that mapping needed from before the flood. So some of the things that we're seeing are hard to interpret whether it's from the flood or not. And so, you know, um, and probably people are just paying attention to the damage areas. That's what we see a lot of these pieces. And so um, creating longitudinal watershed stories would, you know, would really be a powerful tool for us um, moving forward. Stewards watershed. Dave? Well, there's plenty of drone footage from the day it happened, right? and it's pretty amazing footage. It's not the same as being on the ground, but you can document it. Yeah, and I think they're, they're you know, not just pictures, but film clips people have taken. So somebody has to pull it together. Also, the Superior Watershed Council was here for several days, and they were doing a lot of documentation, I think, especially on the the Lake Linden and, and Ripley side of things. And I believe they were being systematic and not just looking at damage. So. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming.